Hello, welcome back to part two of the day, where we're going to kick off with a discussion about future city, city social and civic innovation. And the man that's going to talk to us about this is Yermo Eskelinen, who is the Chief Innovation and Technology Officer of Future Cities Catapult in London. But he works globally on how to make cities better in the world that are urbanizing very fast. He says there's going to be 600 million people that are going to be new city dwellers within the next two decades. And this is the man who's going to make it all sustainable, single-handedly. <laughs> Yermo. No pressures for sure after that. I'll time myself not to, not to go over. Okay, so how do you build a sustainable urban world? Uh, you won't get an answer for that today, but maybe some bits and pieces and ideas of how to, how to approach the, the, uh, the question. So I'm from the Future Cities Catapult. Uh, who knows what it is? Some hands though, so thanks for our comms. Uh, for the rest of you, it's the, uh, we are part of the UK catapult uh, centers system, government funded, or partially government funded innovation centers in areas where the UK should be pulling above its weight, but it quite doesn't. Uh, there are catapults in offshore energy, in cell therapies, and we are in future cities. Uh, I lead a team of multidisciplinary experts from uh, different areas of design, planning, technology, and human sciences. Uh, and the way we do things is to combine theory and, and praxis, so to work through the urban challenges together with the, with the, with the people and with the, uh, with the city leadership. Uh, why care about cities? Well, the main size, the size of the pie was already advertised, it's uh, one of the biggest changes we are going through now globally, uh, urbanization. Uh, and it's of course a massive opportunity for all kinds of new solutions, but it's also a massive challenge because it's not equal at all. There are cities which are only growing without any benefits for quality of life. There are cities which are being depopulized because people are moving to larger metropolises. And then there are sort of spearhead cities, the Londons and New Yorks of the world, which seem to be hoarding all the talent uh, into a very dense and condensed urban metropolitan areas, which also had its share of, share of challenges. But still, cities are the most enduring human achievements. Uh, city of Rome is still there. Uh, Empire of Rome vanished, I don't know exactly how many years back, but it's, it's been a while. Uh, and that also means that to, to renew cities, we must understand that they are very different from, they are not structures, they are not machines, they are not anything you can solve. They are layers upon layers upon layers of unfinished plans. The only thing we know about the city of Dublin of tomorrow, for sure, is that it's going to be different from today and the change never stops. Cities are fundamentally organisms because they consist of us, the people. Still, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't have tried to solve cities. Uh, we are often linked to the smart city phenomena, uh, and which has been kind of a buzzword, a sli slowly dying buzzword, but anyway, buzzword in this space for the past decade or so. Uh, but the uh, Architects have always thought about solving the city. That's Le Corbusier, Cite Radieux in Marseille. The left, one left of that is Tower Blocks. Legacy of Tower Blocks. Le Corbusier, uh, the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright hated that plan and made his own version, which is kind of an agrarian city, Broad Acre. And the legacy of that is highways. Uh, and then there are, let's say, less K or, or less. Uh, celebrated architects who also had grandiose plans. That's Germania from Germany by Albert Speer. Uh, he was supposed to build that uh, to where uh, Berlin now is currently standing. In the good German fashion though, they decided to prototype first because it's a swampland. And this is what Germania is currently. They built this massive concrete block which started to sink the minute they finished it and they understood that they can't actually build those big houses. Uh, in the place where Berlin is because the land, the, the uh, soil doesn't hold the weight of the buildings. 
they never exploded that, so it keeps on sinking in Berlin. Go to see it, it's a slowly moving tourist attraction. And smart cities, in a way, the first wave of those has been a kind of continuation of that trend. That's Masdar from Abu Dhabi, uh, the new great city of the future, uh, completely redesigned, greenfield city. The fact is that the only thing in Masdar, uh, which is there now, is the central block over there. Everything else is still unbuilt. It's about a decade behind the schedule. And these cities didn't seem to be able to scale. And I think that's fundamentally because most cities are not greenfield, empty plots of land from which you can start from anew. We have our cities already. You have to retrofit them to be smart. And much, that's much messier business than trying to just reboot a city. And since cities are layers upon layers of unfinished plans, in most cities, that is never an option. You can't reboot it. You have to live with the legacy of the city. And then you have to live with the people of the city, which always make a mess of your plans. <laughs> cities are for, first and foremost communities, and we city dwellers tend to surprise people who design cities. Highways the fo were actually designed to solve traffic problems. Instead, they multiplied them. And it's only after building those that people understood that if you build capacity for traffic, you get traffic. And you get also empty city centers, which happened in the US, and luckily not to that extent in Europe. So a massive systemic failure caused by wrong analysis. But something is changing, though, and that's we all are carrying gadgets which are sort of changing the way of the urban living. Who doesn't have a smartphone here now? One hand. We have a ludit there. Uh, congratulations. Uh, that's a restaurant day. It's an event in Helsinki in which the city turns into a massive archipelago of pop-up restaurants twice a year. Uh, I think about 1,500 or something the last time it was organized. And it looks like an analog event, you know, people going somewhere to eat food prepared by their peers. But it's actually a digital innovation because you can't fight any of those places unless you can find the info and the info only exists on the internet. So people use their phones to find the restaurants which are in all kinds of parks and related warehouses and <laughs> no matter other imaginary, imaginative places. And we are exceedingly using our cities in the same kind of search mode and porting our services to platforms and that's changing also the physical face of the city. Uh, Ocado is killing local shops because it's so damn handy to get your groceries at home at 6.15 in the morning instead of walking through the rain to get them from your local Tesco, which is worse anyway than Ocado offering. And uh, the city space, the use of the spaces is changing as the consequence of this sort of smart smartification of our daily life. Most spaces are now multi-use spaces. Think about hotel lobbies airports, the cafeteria here, public squares, anywhere with the Wi-Fi. People are using spaces to whichever they want to be doing at that particular moment, moment in time, and the designers are starting to react to this and plan those spaces so that they can accommodate this multi-use. Or then, on the other hand, if they are single-use, that single use is being promoted so heavily that people don't want to be in a multi-use mode in the spaces. Cities are turning into kind of these frameworks, anonymous, anonymous frameworks of, of actions which we decide how, how to use those. You can see it in workplaces, in, in downtown spaces. But um, so, platformication, platformization of uh, services, spatial fluidity, but there's 
one even more fundamental uh, challenge there for cities themselves, and that is the challenge of speed. This all is happening. It's the speed is the basic core ingredient of digitalization, and it's the main reason why, as counterintuitive as it would would seem, the better connected, more connected we are, the more we cluster physically in the same places. We could work from anywhere, and every 10 years or so, people predict that, no, finally, remote working has become so good that I can live in a small village and work, you know, do my work to the city. Yet, that hasn't happened. First time it was ever proposed was in 1975. And every 10 years or so, somebody comes and thinks it's a new idea. Uh, why it doesn't happen is that the uh, time it takes to commercialize an innovation or create a team or kick off a company in a major global hub, innovation hub, the London, the, uh, the Manhattan, it's about a third quicker than anywhere else. It's been actually studied by Richard Florida's team. And that 30% of competitive advantage is so big that it's, it's, you either make it or break it with that. Because digitalization is all about gaining the critical mass before anybody else does, because everybody is getting the same idea, though. That's part of the uh, communication information age. That if you have an idea, you can be sure that somebody else has it at the same time you have it. And then you have to be the one who turns it into company and the critical mass creates the sort of a virtual monopoly situation quicker than anybody else. And uh, don't be mistaken, uh, when a nice startup grows to a certain size, when it becomes the Uber or the Airbnb, it's as evil as any other monopoly out there. And this is the uh, challenge which we are now facing in cities, because first of all, the public services don't seem to be able to innovate at all with the same efficiency. So public sector productivity is dropping. The UK is really suffering from it. And then cities are clueless about what the hell can we do about this? How should we plan our cities? Because cities are used to lead through regulation and policy. And they are both quite slow instruments. They are fantastic instruments, and we certainly do need them. I don't believe in you know, policy-free market uh, urbanization at all. Uh, but they are just too slow in the current situation. And that then brings us to the question of urban experimentation, which finally brings us to the topic of the day. So instead, I'm proposing uh, when we are work in, in, in a way which we call urban experimentation. You try things out, you test. And uh, this is the way all companies develop all services nowadays. So if you are in digital business, you might know about A-B testing. Is the concept familiar to you, A-B testing? Who knows? All right, the rest of you, I break, I break the news gently. When you use any digital service, any, at any moment of time, you are being test subjects, every one of you. So what companies do is to have various, two alternatives of everything running parallel at the same time. Google runs approximately 1,500 A-B tests per day all the time. If two people log in it, they see two different variations of the, of the service, so same page. And the one which is clicked more in this, in, is then chosen to be the final version. They don't assume anything, they test. And the, we can use testing and fast prototyping in the urban landscape as well, but we need to help cities and people who work in cities to utilize those means. And I have a cluster of cases which I thought of discussing through with you. Okay, quickly. Uh, I have about 20 minutes or so, so it's about halfway now, a bit, bit less. Uh, that is the uh, City Mapper. Uh, are you guys using City Mapper? Do you know City Mapper? 
some people use, uh, the rest of you, it's the best transport app in the world. Basically, it's a public transport app using the public, publicly available data of GLA uh, and several other metropolitan cities in the world. Uh, that's one of the areas of data where we have harmonized data sets available in most cities in the world, so you can use the same app in, in different cities. And City Mapper is the best app to tell you how do you get from point A to point B very easily. It beats Google Maps with a long stick. And that innovation there is City Mapper going physical. It's a City Mapper bus, which they have developed in London, because they knew what kind of rides people are searching for. And they noticed that in the between hipster regions of East London, there were no proper connections at 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So they lost those buses. When you kicked off City Mapper at 4 a.m. in the morning on Saturday after coming out of, uh, out of the city club, uh, you were proposed to take a City Mapper bus. And they are currently running several routes then, which we kept on changing and keep on changing based on the, uh, the tests they do. Uh, which are then available through their own platform. And in nice harmony with the uh, GLA, by the way, which is a major difference from the uh, competitor Uber. So they actually do that in, in collaboration. So uh, we have done our share of these kind of things as well, and I'll show you a few cases. Uh, that's the speculative design program around wayfinding, which we ran about two years back. A few concepts. Uh, there's the uh, compass-like gadget to your, to your handlebar, which is actually on the market, or not the same product, but inspired by that, which makes it much easier to focus both on the traffic and where you should be going. Because if you try to follow a mobile phone map while cycling, it's about as dangerous as doing that while you're driving. And in London tra traffic, it's not a good idea. You need something simpler, and that that is the simpler. So it basically the dark green area shows you the kind of direction where you should be heading. Then you can take different routes to get there, uh, around the block this way or that way. Uh, here's another concept from the same. Uh, that's basically a laser-based concept for buses, which shows you the uh, dead angle of a bus. That's the area to which bus driver can't see. So you don't go there. Except you, if you're self-destructive, then you can go there. Uh, here's another project we did in London called Sensing London, together with the uh, Hyde, Hyde Park Authority, to help them to understand better how the park is being used, and uh, for example, what kind of air quality they have. They can they brag about the air being better than in neighboring areas. Uh, we installed these uh, sensing gadgets there. And this is also an interesting test because it gave us completely unexpected results in the form of, of squirrels. Uh, because our sensors were all turned into nests in about three weeks' time. <laughs> so it was a, a complete disaster, the whole, whole pilot. But we did learn a lot about, about you know, building a robust sensor boxes, though. So there was a silver lining to this particular case. Uh, in the digital domain, this is a growth story, fittingly because it's called a growth planner. This is the first prototype of growth planner. The idea of the growth planner was to develop a tool which makes it easy to play around with, uh, with, uh, with planning. Planning, funny enough, even though we have uh, BIM and we have CAD and all kinds of digital tools, it's horribly analog and an opaque process. And there's a whole industry of people who try to decipher digital, digital information for planners so that they can plan well. So what we did there was that what if we took all the data available for planning and put it in a map interface where you can project that if I put a very big house here, what happens to my transport network, to my electricity network, to my gas network, what are, what are the needs to the urban infrastructure around this place? Because that's fundamental information in planning. First prototype was done for Manchester. I had a nice video about the next one, which was done in Belfast, but I couldn't run it here because of the uh, time and technical constraints of that. So the screen grab, that's in production use. So we tried it out in Manchester. Now it's in production use by Belfast City Planning Department. And they can basically take any uh, 
plot or area, and then chunk a virtual piece uh, of, of building property there, this many workplaces, that many, uh, that many apartments, and then it starts to give you the constraints of electricity, water, wastewater, and, and uh, commuting uh, networks around it, but you can prepare for those needs as well. And this has now expanded, expanded to the uh, whole line of work which we call future of planning. So what we, what we want to do is to disrupt the whole planning system of the UK so that it's evidence and outcome data-based, uh, real-time planning ecosystem where you can be like, float your plans on top of, of, on top of real-time data all the time and they can make that available for people as well. So that you can see your plans, local plans, in a 3D model uh, in, your, in your neighborhood. I mean, currently the uh, interface for plans is this A4, which you can find somewhere in your local street, uh, taped on the, uh, on the light, pole, light pole saying that there's gonna be a 50-story building in this plot <laughs> in one year's time. Do you have anything to say about it? Um, I'll close then with this quite fundamental question. If we go then from working with the city authorities to actually working with the citizens, like the planning project intends to go, then it's good to understand who are these users anyway. Uh, these users in here are part of our ambulance service user test group, which we uh, project we, we did in uh, Liverpool last year. Uh, but uh, what I thought about talking is actually a mathematical equation. That probably needs some opening up. So that is originally the uh, equation from William Riker and Peter Odeshulk from 1968, and that is the probability of voting. How probable it is that people vote. Uh, and why I open this up is that cities tend to have naive expectations about the willingness of people to invest their time and energy to help them to sort their issues out. You can do it, but you have to understand what are the ingredients. And this gives you the ingredients. So first, P, that's the, uh, that's the probability. If the probability of anything happening is zero, people don't bother. Why would they? Why would I go to vote or why would I join a participation process if nothing is going to happen? Good example from Finland, home, hometown, uh, where the uh, Finnish government asked opinions about the uh, digital healthcare systems a couple of years back and they got 35 answers from the nation of Finland <laughs> because everybody knew they are not going to do a thing about it. Second is benefit. So uh, what, what's in it for me? All right, yeah, it's probable something will happen if I participate, but is there anything in it, in it for me personally? If not, why should I? And this is time. So if either of those is zero, the sum is zero. D is the sense of duty, like civic duty. And that's the part which cities tend to exaggerate that everybody would really love to you know, spend endless evenings in sorting out city issues for free. Uh, most people don't. Some people do, and then you need to understand, of course, who those are, because often these processes are hijacked by groups of individuals driving any certain topics, like the uh, Barack Obama's famous, what's the most important challenge I need to solve when he came, was, was elected, and the answer was legalizing marijuana because that's what the uh, population of USA voted to be top number one. C is the cost, and that's something which is interesting because it's cost is effort, time, probably even money if you have to take a bus or whatever, uh, and you can lower the cost uh, by, for example, simple tools to use, digital planning. That's why we're doing it. It lowers the cost of participation because it's easier to understand the plans takes less time, less effort. And the right, left-handed side should be bigger than the right-handed side. And what we are seeing is that there's a new 
equation there, that's added by Anthea Watson Strong from Google, and that, that's N, which is the network effect. That, which is that if we see what our peers are doing, it has an effect because we are part of a community. It's not a singular decision. It's a decision of, of by me and my friends, and I want to impress my friends or be part of the group of friends or otherwise uh, join the group. And that is, for example, the force which is driving open source communities online. Nobody is paid, but everybody is recognized. And the city should then sort out that equation in order for people to participate. And I close with a few cases which tell you how it can be done. That's Paris. Paris is devoting 5% of the budget to participatory budgeting schemes. That means that the uh, people of the boroughs of Paris can decide what's done with a pretty sizable chunk of the city budget. They can propose uh, good uses for the money. They can vote for those. There's a certain guarantee that certain amount of that money lands to every borough, and then the best ones are being put into use. So there's a benefit because it comes to your area, there's a probability because it's actually money, it's coming, coming there, uh, there are handy tools to be part of it, uh, and it's transparent, so there's also the sense of community. It basically meets all the, uh, all the five criteria com by combining top-down and bottom-up approaches. Second, one city is not a market, and we are preaching openness, openness and interoperability of data of urban systems, and we are not preaching it for the sake of socialism or for the sake of, uh, like, of, or, of uh, um, any, any beliefs, but for the sake of pragmatism. Being open is the quickest way to build compatible systems in the landscape which is as splintered as our global cities are at the moment. Uh, think about Android, how quickly that took over the uh, mobile phone platforms market. Reason was it, it was open source, anybody could use it. So everybody started using it. Third, join forces with those who know how things are done. Uh, no matter how clever people we have working for the city hall, most clever people in any city are not working for the city hall. Just, you know, because of the size of numbers. Uh, and there are clever developers in most cities. You can join forces with that is all, again, a picture from Helsinki. Helsinki Love Developers Program, where we brought the city, the venture capitalists, and the developers together. Every year, it keeps on happening. Every year, a few companies are created. Some of those make it big. And they also solve the city challenges. And four, and this is the reason for our existence, you have to have the intermediaries, the labs, who can connect the change makers. Change makers in all organizations are a lonely bunch. Look at the, in, in public department, there are some people who really would like to change the things with the way things are done, and they are mostly alone. And they think they are alone, uh, and there's nobody else in the whole city, maybe, who, who's like that. Well, probably not quite that gloomy, but anyway. But you can use the labs, the neutral matchmakers, to bring them together. That's what we do in, in cities, and it is working. Because sit, nothing is more difficult than for city department to work with the other city department. I mean, it's easier for the Cold War, Russia, and USA to work together. Uh, but they can do it if there's a pragmatic goal to, goal to sort out together. And often, sorting out the joint challenge kind of builds the collaboration axis as a side product, and that makes cities work better. Lastly, we also then work internationally. That's a project called Sharing Cities, European Union funded project in which three big cities of London, Lisbon and Milan are trying to build more sustainable energy and transport systems. And our job in that particular project is to take care of the work package called people, because there's one side of sustainability, which is infrastructure, and solutions to the other side, which is how do we use it. And we try to change the pe way people use it. And just as the story of how we work in sprints, so we develop through user creation together with the cities, eight concepts, and then we merge those together into one, this is one of the concepts, and it's merged then into one wireframe app, which is then going to implement, be implemented in all three cities in different formats, 
I probably won't be showing the film in its entirety, but anyway, that's basically a blueprint user interface, user, user path of the app. And we are not the ones who are going to do it, actually, in the, in the cities. They all have their local partners, so they get a local, local flavor to each of the versions. But the trick is that it's going to be using harmonized data models, harmonized uh, APIs, and basically if one company makes a great app for London, the same app will work in Lisbon, and it will work in Milan. And of course, if more and more cities adopt the same uh, interfaces, the market is, is even bigger. So that's how you build a compatible smart city, or let's drop the word smart, city market. I think I need to close with that because I think I went over time already. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm not sure if there's time for questions. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs>